Uh, I'd like to add my welcome to the ones that you've already received uh, and a warm welcome to those joining us online. Uh, I'm excited for next Sunday for us to be celebrating our fifth birthday service uh, together. Uh, it's going to be an incredible service uh, and we're going to have a handful of people getting baptized uh, or dedicated um, and there's still room for more. Uh, so today is kind of the final call out if you're uh, interested in being baptized or dedicated, uh, we're keen to lock that in. Uh, we need you to jump online to koa.co slash briz and fill out our expression of interest form uh, today, ideally, uh, so that we can follow you up uh, about being baptized next week uh, and also uh, about our baptism class that will be happening on Zoom tomorrow night. Uh, but this morning, we're following on from last week's passage in Luke chapter 8. Uh, if you have a paper Bible with you, or if you have your Bible on your phone, uh, could I invite you to keep it open uh, to the passage that we're looking at so you can follow along. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, we'd love to gift you with one. Uh, after the service, uh, you can head out and see our team at the info desk, and they'd love to give you a Bible. Uh, but as we come now to this time in God's Word, would you pray with me that God would speak to us? Father, Thank you uh, that we can physically gather together uh, this morning. Thank you that uh, your word uh, has already been read out. Uh, thank you that we have your word uh, to know more of who you are. Uh, as we dive into today's passage, would you work in our hearts and our minds through your Holy Spirit that we would encounter Jesus? Uh, would you be at work in our midst, transforming lives for the glory of your holy name? Amen. I remember back uh, in the year 2000, uh, Queen Elizabeth came and visited Australia. Uh, I had grown up in this small town in northwest New South Wales called Burke, and the Queen was coming to visit Burke. Uh, that was a big deal. People came from all around, some traveling hundreds of kilometers to come and meet the Queen, or at least come and see the Queen, even if they didn't get to meet her face to face. Uh, the town spent months preparing for her arrival. There was a buzz in the air. Everyone had heard about it. Uh, and when she came, the people were lining the streets, all waiting in anticipation, hoping to catch a glimpse of Her Royal Majesty, all straining to hear any words that she might speak. In Luke chapter 8, verse 40, we see that a crowd has also gathered to welcome Jesus back. Uh, where is He coming back from? Well, last week we saw that Jesus had sailed across the lake to the land of the Gerasenes. Uh, and after the people of the region had seen Jesus heal the demon-possessed man, they were afraid of Him. Uh, and so they asked Him to leave. So He returns back to Galilee, where He is met by this crowd waiting for Him. Jesus' reputation as a miracle worker and as a teacher had begun to spread far and wide, and these people had gathered in anticipation of what they might see and hear next. Uh, in today's passage in Luke 8, we actually see two encounters that Jesus has. Firstly, there's the encounter that He has with Jairus, uh, and this encounter bookends the second encounter that he has with an unnamed woman. Both of these stories are intertwined. Uh, both Jairus and the woman come to Jesus with a sense of expectation and a sense of hope in what he might be able to do for them. Along with the rest of the crowd that is gathered, they have heard reports of what Jesus has done. Lepers healed, the dead raised back to life, demons cast out. This man has a power and an authority that no one else, no other teacher has displayed. Can he help them with the issues that they are facing in their own lives? They believe so, and this drives them to their actions, and we're going to take a closer look at their encounters. So after Jesus arrives back, Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue comes to him and falls at his feet. 
imploring him to come to his house to heal his daughter who is dying. Now, Jairus, as the ruler of the synagogue, is an important man. He plays a significant role in the life of the synagogue. He calls the shots. He organizes the services that happen in the synagogue. He is known as a person of high standing within society. And yet, such is his distress in this moment that he comes to Jesus, falls at his feet, and earnestly begs Jesus to come back to his house to heal his daughter. Now, I'm not a father, uh, so I can only imagine the anguish that Jairus must have knowing that his 12-year-old daughter is so sick, she only has moments to live. He doesn't care how the crowd perceives him in this moment as he comes to Jesus. In verse 42, it says, as Jesus went, which implies that Jesus was moved by Jairus' request and he goes with him. So far, so good. Jairus has reached Jesus and he's convinced him to come back to his house to heal his daughter. But then we get to the second encounter. As they're making their way back to Jairus' house, battling in amongst the crowd, Jesus stops in his tracks. Someone has touched him. Peter's like, don't be ridiculous, Jesus. Of course someone's touched you. We're pushing our way through this crowd. What did you expect? But it wasn't just a physical touch that had stopped Jesus in his tracks. Jesus had perceived that his power had gone out and healed whoever had touched him. The big question he was asking was, well, who was it who had reached out and touched him? With Jesus there stopped in the midst of this crowd, can you imagine how Jairus must be feeling? His daughter is dying, time is short. And here Jesus is stopped in the middle of this crowd asking who touched him. Jairus doesn't know if his daughter is still alive. And yet the one person who could actually save her is now suddenly distracted. In Luke 8, 43, it tells us who touched Jesus. It was a sickly woman who had a discharge of blood. And she'd had this discharge for the past 12 years years. This woman was unclean, and according to the religious law, she would remain unclean until uh, the discharge had stopped, and she still had seven days after that before she could be confirmed as no longer being unclean. This religious law is explained back in Leviticus chapter 15. Uh, So, we're going to turn back there and just read what it says in Leviticus to understand a bit more about this law. Now, the verses will be on the screen behind me, but it says in Leviticus 15 from verse 25, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge, she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, shall be to her as the bed of her impurity. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanness of her menstrual impurity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. But if she is cleansed, of her discharge, she shall count for herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day, she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons and bring them to the priest, to the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall use one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for her unclean discharge. Thus, you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. One commentator on this passage from Leviticus writes this, these conditions, these 
bodily discharges of both men and women were thus not evil in themselves. They only prevented one from entering into the worship of God with other members of the covenant community. The presence of uncleanness in the tabernacle precinct would defile the dwelling place of God. Uh, For those who were with us, if you remember back to our series in Exodus, there were very strict measures in place with regards to who or what could enter into the presence of God. Uh, There were also strict purification processes that were in place uh, for people to undergo in order to approach God. Only that which was pure and undefiled was allowed to be brought before Him. Bodily discharges, while not evil in and of themselves, still made a person unclean, preventing them from engaging normally within uh, society for set periods of time. This These bodily discharges prevented people from engaging in worship to God with the rest of their community for the time that they remained unclean. In the case of the woman in Luke 8, she had been cut off from these things for the past 12 years. She was cut off from being able to worship God in the tabernacle or in the temple in the New Testament. She was cut off from engaging with the rest of society because she was unclean. Can you imagine her state of mind after 12 years of isolation? Today, people's mental health is suffering with a whole bunch of lockdowns and restrictions because of COVID. This woman has been in isolation for 4,380 days. That is a long time to be in isolation apart from everyone else. It's not just that no one's been able to touch her and she hasn't been able to have that uh, community around her, but they can't touch anything she has touched unless they too be made unclean. So consequently, everyone would have avoided her like the plague. This woman should not have been anywhere near this crowd. Unlike Jairus, who is of high standing in society, this woman is a social outcast. But she has heard reports of what Jesus has done. And having spent all her money on doctors with no success, there was literally no one else for her to turn to. If anyone could heal her, it would be Jesus knowing that the consequences of being caught out in this crowd would be drastic. Her approach to Jesus is quite secretive. She sneaks up behind Him, reaches out and touches the fringe of His garment. And in that very moment, as her fingers touch His garment, immediately she is healed. And in that very same moment, Jesus knows that His power has been used And this is what has brought him to the abrupt stop in the midst of the crowd. We can tell by Peter's response that he is mystified as to why Jesus would even ask the question of who has touched him, given they're jostling through this crowd. But Jesus knew that something more had happened, and he wasn't about to move on until this had been resolved. In verse 47, you can read with me that, And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Despite trying to fly under the radar, the woman knows that she's been caught out. And she's rightfully fearful of how Jesus and the crowd might respond to why she's there. She comes trembling to Jesus and falling at His feet. She declares why she's come and what it is that Jesus has done in healing her of her sickness. By all rights, her touching Jesus should have resulted in Him becoming unclean. But because of who Jesus is, rather than her uncleanness affecting Him, His power over sickness and disease affects her miraculously 
killing her instead. And rather than rebuking the woman for sneaking up behind him, Jesus responds to her in verse 48 saying, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Jesus' response to this woman is one of love and one of acceptance. He calls her daughter openly declaring that she need not fear coming to him. But he also recognizes and affirms her faith in him. It is because of her faith in him that she is now well. This is good news, particularly for this woman. And yet what happens next in the passage is actually some bad news. In verse 49, we see that while Jesus was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house, that's Jairus' house, comes and says, your daughter is dead, do not trouble the teacher anymore. Can you imagine how Jairus must be feeling in that moment? He had come to Jesus with the hope that he would come and heal his daughter before she died. They might have even made it if Jesus hadn't have actually stopped in the midst of the crowd and gotten distracted. I mean, you know, the woman's condition was not good. It wasn't great, but it wasn't life-threatening. Couldn't Jesus have just coordinated to come back to her and heal her after dealing with Jairus' daughter first? But no, he didn't do that, and now Jairus' daughter is dead. And I imagine that Jairus is rightly devastated by this turn of events. But Jesus heard what the messenger said to Jairus, and he answers and says to Jairus himself, do not fear, only believe and she will be well. Now taken on its own, this comment is not all that reassuring. Don't fear, just believe in me and it will be well. But the person telling him this, Jesus, has just shown his power and his authority over sickness. So Jesus is saying to Jairus, Jairus, you've heard the stories of what I have done. That's why you came to me in the first place. That's why you put your trust in me. You did that based on the things you have heard about me. You've just seen now with your own two eyes what I am capable of doing having healed this woman. Trust me. It's going to be okay. I've got this. And in the midst of his grief and his sorrow, we can see there is still a glimmer of hope for Jairus as he continues to trust in Jesus, as they continue then on to Jairus' home. When they arrive, Jesus takes three of his closest disciples, Jairus and his wife, and they go into the room where the girl's body is lying. In verse 54 of Luke chapter 8, it says, but taking her, this Jesus, taking her by the hand, he called saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned and she got up at once and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Jesus comes through Despite the hiccups in the timeline that Jairus probably would have preferred, he gets to witness Jesus raise his daughter from death to life. Jesus' timing was on point. He was not late to the occasion. And because of his timing, he was able to show through these encounters that he has power over sickness, but even more than that, he has power and authority over death. Take a moment and consider that. This Jesus who we often talk about, who we've seen in the Gospel of Luke, has the power and authority over sickness and death. What powerful encounters that both Jairus and the woman have had with Jesus. As we've looked at these encounters, there's a word that keeps popping up. And the word is faith. It's a word frequently thrown around, I have 
of faith, or I have faith in this, or I have faith in that, or maybe it's I don't have faith in that. But what does the word faith actually mean? Faith means to have complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And the truth is that we all apply this concept uh, or the lack thereof on a daily basis. If you're someone who sets an alarm to wake you up in the morning, you have faith that that alarm will wake you up. Perhaps you don't have faith that that alarm will wake you up, and so therefore you set 10 alarms, uh, two minutes apart, uh, in order to make sure that you're guaranteed to be awake. This is just a more simple example of faith, but when it comes to bigger things in life, what or who is your faith in? In what or who do you put your trust and confidence in? When things are going well, what is your confidence in? What is the object of your trust when you're going through a health crisis? In the midst of relationships with family, with friends, with colleagues, what is your object of faith? Some that are often used are money, health, jobs, people. They're all potential objects that we can put our trust in. But in reality, those things, those people, they're all temporary. And time and time again, they will fail us. If your trust is constantly in the wrong things, then eventually your confidence wears thin. But what if there was one being in whom you could have faith, in whom you could have complete and utter confidence in, no matter what is happening around you? Well, based on the evidence that we've seen in Luke's gospel and in these encounters this morning, I believe that Jesus is such a one that we can put our complete trust and confidence in. Do you likewise believe that? Both Jairus and the woman provide us with examples of what it looks like to place complete trust and confidence in Jesus. And there are three types of faith that we see expressed by them in this passage. Now that we've gone over their encounters with Jesus, let's go back and see how their faith is displayed, how they display their faith in Jesus, and how their trust in Him might help us to do likewise. Firstly, Jairus shows a trusting faith in Jesus. His daughter is sick and dying, but he believes that Jesus can heal her. However, as we read earlier, Jesus gets waylaid by this woman with the discharge of blood, and during that encounter, Jairus' daughter dies. Rather than taking a a first-in, first-served approach Jesus stops his journey back to Jairus' house in order to engage with the woman who has just been healed. Can you imagine the thoughts that must be going through Jairus' mind in that moment? Hurry up! We've got somewhere we need to be. My daughter's dying here. Jesus, what are you doing? We don't have time to stop. Jesus, do you even care? Have you ever wished that God would (laughs) listen to you when you tell Him how and when to do things in your life? I'm sure Jairus was wishing that right then. And even more so when the messenger arrives with the news of his daughter's death. But Jesus' response is, Don't be afraid, trust in me, and it will all be okay. That is a bold faith that Jairus needs to have to continue trusting in Jesus, despite the heartbreaking news he has received. And despite the timing of events not working out according to how he would have liked them to have panned out. I don't know all the ins and outs of your lives, but right now, maybe you're going through some really difficult times as well. 
Maybe you're facing some kind of disease or sickness, maybe even death. Maybe you're journeying with someone who might be facing these things. Maybe you've been praying fervently for God to intervene and to provide healing, and yet nothing seems to be happening. Whatever the hardship is that you're facing, would you keep trusting Jesus in the midst of it all? Would you remind yourself of who Jesus is? Would you remind yourself of the power and authority that He holds even over death? Jairus' faith in Jesus led to his daughter being raised back to life. However, there's no promise that this will or won't happen in the situations that you're facing. There's no promise that just because your faith is in Jesus, therefore, people will be healed or people will be returned to life. In Romans 11.33, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been His counselor? God's timing is often not our timing. Things that we want to put off, God often acts on sooner. Things that we want to happen now, God often has in store for later. But in the end, His timing is better than ours. So whatever you're facing, would you keep trusting in Jesus, knowing that there is a day coming when things will be better for those whose trust is in Him. There is a day coming when God will dwell with us, with His people. In the book of Revelation, we read, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things will have passed away. Would you, like Jairus, hear the words of Jesus to not fear, but only to believe? And would you keep trusting Jesus? Would you keep believing in Him, trusting in the One who has the power and authority over sickness and death? The second type of faith I want to point out is the faith of the woman. Her faith is a timid faith. She has an embarrassing past that she has no intention of airing in the open. If she came boldly like Jairus did, publicly declaring why she needed to see Jesus, she would have copped the scorn and the anger of the crowd. Those who might have come in contact with her would blame her for making them unclean because of her uncleanness. No one wants that kind of attention. Also, maybe she thought that Jesus wouldn't accept her because of her uncleanness. However, such is her trust in Jesus and the confidence that she has in His ability to heal her, she is compelled to act. So despite not wanting to draw attention to herself, she finds a position, gets herself ready, and waits for the perfect moment to reach out and touch the fringe of His garment. And I love Jesus' response. Rather than rebuking her, rather than condemning her, Jesus welcomes her as His daughter, and He affirms that her faith has healed her. Maybe you also have an embarrassing past, an embarrassing history, things about yourself that you think would prevent Jesus from accepting someone like yourself. If you would come and act on your trust in Jesus, if you would come and encounter Him, you'll find that just like this woman, no matter how timid your faith might be, Jesus will welcome you. And the love the forgiveness, the grace, the peace that He gives is so much better than living in the embarrassment and the shame of the past. So this morning, would you come? Would you encounter this Jesus? And would you actively put your trust in Him? So far, we've seen examples of a trusting faith that Jairus had 
in the midst of the timing being all out, uh, in the midst of the news that he received of his daughter's death. And we see a timid faith of this woman who sneaks up behind Jesus, uh, but acts because she believes in him. Final example I want to point out is a testifying faith. It took being called out by Jesus for the woman to declare what God had done in her life. Even then, she came forward trembling. Apart from her embarrassment, she was afraid to make herself known in public and to tell of the healing that she'd just experienced. It was also countercultural for a woman to speak publicly in those days. But despite any misgivings that she might have had, by the grace of God, she declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched Jesus and how she had been immediately healed. What an incredible testimony. Can you imagine the awe and wonder of the crowds who are hearing that Jesus has just healed this woman without even speaking, without even directing any specific attention towards her? For them to hear of her confidence in Jesus, of how that has led to her healing, is a wonderful signpost pointing people to the person and the power and authority of Jesus. If you have had an encounter, a personal encounter with Jesus, and you've put your faith in Him, how is it that He has transformed you? How is it that He has transformed your life? Would you share that good news with the people around you, that they might hear of the goodness of God? Whether trusting in Jesus has led to a a drastic, a dramatic change in your life, or whether it's led to more subtle changes, would you declare for others to hear how trusting in Jesus has been better than trusting in other things, even if to the human eye it might not look that way? Perhaps by declaring God's goodness in your life, Others might turn and put their trust in Jesus. Perhaps pointing someone to Jesus by telling them your story might help them to have hope in the midst of the challenges that they're facing themselves. Even if you're nervous about sharing, even if there might be embarrassment associated with the past, even if you come with trembling, would your faith be one that testifies to what God has done in your life. Speaking of the examples of trusting faith, timid faith, and testifying faith, as seen in Luke 8, uh, commentator Daryl Bock writes this, Faith should seize the initiative to act in dependence on God and speak about Him. Yet sometimes it must be patient. In one sense, faith is full speed ahead, while in another, it is waiting on the Lord. Our lives require a vibrant faith applied to the affairs of life, but it also requires a patient waiting on the Lord, for the Father does know best. As I invite the band out, as they begin to play, earlier in Luke 8, we're pointed to the fact that Jesus has authority over creation, when He commands the winds and the waves to be still. Last week, we were pointed to the fact that Jesus has power and authority over demons. This week, we're pointed to the fact that Jesus has authority over sickness and death. All things bow their knee to the authority and power of Jesus. And yet, at the same time, this Jesus in all His power and authority is the same one who humbles Himself and lays down His life on a cross, paying the price for all of our rebellion against God, so that those who trust in Him might have their relationship with God restored. Jesus' Jesus' invitation is for all to come to Him, whether you think you might be the cream of society, whether you think you might be an outcast of society or somewhere in between. As you consider who who Jesus is this morning, would you see Him? 
in all of His power and authority, but would you also see Him as the one who lovingly opens wide His arms to welcome you? He invites you saying, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus' final words to the woman in Luke 8 are, go in peace. There may be other things which might provide temporary peace in this world, but if you are longing for a peace that is able to endure no matter the circumstances, that can only be found by coming and encountering this Jesus. When you trust in Him, when your complete confidence is in Him, you can go in the peace that He gives, knowing that your past has been dealt with. You have been forgiven, knowing that the God who created all things personally loves and cares for you as an individual, knowing that your future has been secured because of what has been accomplished through Jesus' perfect life, His sacrificial death, and His triumphant resurrection. He is the only one who can give you true rest, true peace. Would you come to Him? Would you encounter Jesus and put your faith in Him this morning? If your faith is already in Him, would you keep trusting Him, whatever life might throw at you? Would you keep trusting Him and would you be bold in declaring the goodness of God and how He has impacted your life? I invite you to stand this morning and as we stand, let us come to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the one who has power and authority over creation, over demons, over sickness, over death. Would you help us to put our trust in him this morning? Would you help us to be reminded of his power, particularly in the moments when things don't seem to be happening in the timing that we want them to or We're facing challenges in life. Would you help us to trust in your timing? Would you help us to keep trusting Jesus in the waiting? Thank you that you are sovereign. Help us to remember that our future is secure with you. Help us to keep trusting that Jesus is better than anything else the world might throw at us in its attempts to give us a false sense of peace. Help us to be bold in proclaiming the good things that you have done for us so that we might be reminded of your goodness, but also so that others might come to know your goodness as well. Would you help us to remember Jesus' love and gentleness towards us and give us the strength we need to stand firm in him? It is in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen.